Welcome to our global launch on gender responsive leadership. My name is Kristen Valasek. I'm a senior specialist on women, peace and security here at the Folke Bernadotte Academy. And I will be your moderator here today. So first things first, it is wonderful to see that we already have over 135 people joining us here today from around the world. I'm sure that more uh, will trickle in in moments. And I want to let you know, we have enabled something called Zoom translated captions. So if you want to follow this launch in Spanish, in Arabic, uh, in French, in Ukrainian, or any of the other 33 languages that Zoom supports, please um, find the instructions in chat for this. Um, bienvenue à toutes et à tous, si vous souhaitez de sous-titres en français. Uh, voyez lire les instructions dans le chat. Um, bienvenidos a todas y a todos. En el chat se puede encontrar instrucciones de cómo activar subtítulos en español traducidos por Zoom. Now we have all gathered here today to deepen our understanding of gender responsive leadership. So it's a critical and sometimes missing part of the puzzle as to how we can really accelerate implementation of the International Agenda on Women, Peace and Security and a UN SDG 5 on gender equality. So what we're going to spend our time doing here today um, are three things. First, we're going to be building, thank you, uh, a joint understanding of what is gender responsive leadership and why it's important with myself and Marcus. Second, we're going to have a discussion and question and answers Q&A together with Leslie, the fantastic author of our handbook on gender responsive leadership and Gabriela, who will, um, who is also a co-editor of the handbook. And finally, we have the pleasure of hearing from three senior leaders in the EU, OSC and UN system. So uh, Ambassador Killian Wall, Lloyd Ari, and Paco Garcia to tell us a little bit more about what has it been like to participate in a gender responsive leadership learning program and how they have successfully taken leadership action on gender equality. So we look forward to having a participatory webinar, a participatory launch, and uh, for those of you who are familiar with FBA, we are going to do what we always do, which is to make sure that we can be interactive here today. So we will be opening up a chat function shortly, later on a Q&A, and we'll be using something called um, Menti, and I'll explain that in a moment. But when we do open up the Q&A, I encourage you to already be writing in your questions for the speakers, um, Put in your comments as well. You know, there's a vast amount of expertise and experience here in the room today. So use the Q&A to share your tips, your resources, to say hello and to share your good practices as well. Also, please note that this global launch is being recorded. So with permission from all the speakers and we'll be sharing it later on the FBA YouTube channel. Now, in this digital world, which we seem to be spending more and more of our time in, it's also important to take a moment and actually connect with who's in the room here today. So right now we have over 239 people with us today um, and uh, all here to discuss gender responsive leadership. So let's take a moment to quickly introduce ourselves using the chat function. Now, Maybe write your name, a quick hello, your organization, and in particular, what, um, what city and country are you in right now? Because thanks to our amazing colleague Rodrigo and uh, new technology, um, he, we'll be able to visualize where a few of you are right now from around the globe. So let's see how that works. I'm already seeing um, some greetings in the chat.
not surprisingly, we have people joining us from Stockholm, Sweden, which is where I'm speaking from right now. Uh, I'm seeing a, a wow, fantastic. People from New York, Brussels, Nairobi, South Africa, DRC, China, Kiev, Colombia. Wonderful. Bonjour. Bienvenue. Hi from Tbilisi. We have people joining us early morning from uh, Bogota. Maybe a few joining us a little bit later on the day from other parts of the world. This is making me want to spend more of my time traveling. <laughs> Hello, Constance from Germany. Mm. Mm, GIZ. Bosnia. Wonderful. It's lovely to see and to hear from you all. So um, keep writing in chat. You'll get a sense of who's in the room here today. And fantastic that you could all spend some time um, together with us, joining us online and I look forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. And now um, let me welcome Marcus Dierblum. He's a director of the Department for Conflict Prevention and Peacebuilding here at the Folke Bernadotte Academy. So Marcus, why focus on gender responsive leadership now? Well, Kristen, there are several answers to that question, aren't there? First, when it comes to uh, the need for consistent attention to uh, gender equality issues, we know that progress has been made on the women, peace and security agenda, but it's been slow. Second, when it comes to uh, leadership, um, the evidence is clear. We know from research, from policy and from practice that leaders and managers are critical for enacting change. And that goes for the organizations also around them and trusted to them. Anyone in the position of a leadership has the power to advance gender equality and to accelerate the implementation of the women, peace and security agenda and should do so. And third, perhaps timing right now, the global landscape around us is one of multiple crises um, with a growing number of armed conflicts, um, the climate crisis, pandemics, a shrinking space for democracy, shrinking space for civil society organizations and widening socioeconomic inequalities within and between countries. These and other factors have contributed to a global rollback, some would even say a global pushback on gender equality and women's rights during the past few years. In fact, according to the 2022 UN snapshot, we're looking at, with a linear assumption, 140 years uh, until women are represented equally in positions of leadership and power. Taken together, this is why gender equality, and in particular strengthening the freedom and empowerment of women and girls remain a key priority of the Swedish gov government and by extension FBA as a government agency. In the fragile and conflict affected settings where we work, be it Ukraine, Moldova, the DRC, Colombia, we deliver on those priorities and we're trying to do that in a gender responsive way. As I mentioned, uh, as an organization, uh, having spent more than 15 years working on women, peace and security, we know that leaders and managers are uh, absolutely crucial when it comes to driving gender equality forward. But let me be clear, we're not suggesting that all leaders need to become gender equality experts. 
nor that web and peace and security should be their main or even dominant area of work. We're stating a simple truth, which is that our daily work for peace, security and development can and should be done in a manner so that it reduces inequalities. Others will talk more about this later, but within the framework of what we call gender responsive leadership, several skills are singled out. One is the ability to manage staff, resources and activities. Many organizations and workplaces have integrated systems for advancing gender equality. For instance, dedicated staff working as gender advisors or gender focal points. But the gender equality work cannot be outsourced only to these functions. The individuals themselves might be amazing. There may be tools and policies in place, but they cannot do it alone. It is for us as leaders and managers to take the responsibility for creating an equitable workplace and to ensure that the organization's time, money and activities are having a concrete positive impact on the lives of all the diverse women and men, girls and boys that we work for and with. It is up for us as leaders to communicate convincingly and, uh, and clearly to our staff that this is something that we need to work with and hold ourselves accountable. And that goes for us as leaders as well. It doesn't have to be the grandest of plans. Sometimes systematic incremental steps that retain the attention on the issue and produce concrete results are both easier and more, more tangible. It may be calling a department meeting dedicating to discussing how gender mainstreaming can be advanced it may be asking for gender mainstreaming action plans to codify and learn from the work already being done, to address gaps and set clear targets that can be followed up. These are things that I have tried and done in my position, and the results are promising. This is my role as a leader, to motivate and support my staff to take effective action and see to it that the preconditions and prerequisites are in place. Another skill is leading by example. I, as well as many others in this virtual room, have been entrusted with leadership responsibilities. As leaders, we should recognize that we have the authority and the experience to place gender equality at the center of our peace, security and development work. As a leader, I can use my power and my privilege to not only advocate gender equality, but also make it a key part of my leadership. So these are some of the whys of gender responsive leadership and perhaps also the why of the important timing of it right now. Leaders and managers on all levels, together with their teams, have the power to reduce gender equalities in their own sphere of influence. With the Gender Responsive Leaders Handbook, we can hopefully support leaders and managers with contemporary evidence-based approaches on how to wield that power wisely and effectively. Thank you so much, Marcus. And this is very much why FBA's focus on gender responsive leadership is precisely on the women, the men, the non-binary people in positions of leadership in managerial roles who often have this untapped power to create positive change for gender equality. When we launched our initiative on gender responsive leadership four years ago, we couldn't really find uh, you know, an existing academic definition of gender responsive leadership or a policy definition. It was there in EU policy, um, but without you know, uh, an explained definition or concept around what, what do these words mean? What does this term mean? So the first part of our process towards achieving this handbook and other materials was really to sit down, do a literature review, consult experts in the field of women, peace and security, gender equality and leadership, and come up with a clear definition. What do we mean with gender responsive leadership? And um, so we designed our own. Thank you, Niklas, which is that a gender responsive leader uses their leadership position and skills to actively work towards gender equality and women's rights, both in the workplace and through their organization's external activities. So there were a couple things we wanted to pull out here. One is really this focus on leadership position 
you know, as Marcus was saying, having the power, having the authority, the responsibility um, to be driving change within the organization is very much a leadership responsibility. And it's also a set of well-honed skills and experiences. And we wanted to really focus in on mobilizing and using this role, using position and skills of leadership to drive gender equality. And the second is kind of, it's both a, a two-pronged focus. In FBA, we have traditionally more focused in externally on implementation of the Women, Peace and Security agenda, but we realized you can't call yourself a gender responsive leader if you're only doing fantastic work in the field, so important, but you also has to be reflected in how you act with your staff, what type of workplace culture um, you're creating, uh, your, how you're role modeling you know, gender equality in the workplace. So that's our definition of gender responsive leadership. Now, um, we wanted to take it a step further and really break this definition down. Uh, Leslie will be mentioning this later, um, but you know, getting this question from leaders, what should I practically be doing? So based on this definition, we developed a, you know, kind of a conceptual framework with five key leadership skills and under each one, multiple concrete actions that leaders and managers can take in their daily work, in their role as leaders and managers to um, forward gender equality. So we're gonna watch a short clip now that, uh, that introduces this framework on gender responsive leadership. A gender responsive leader doesn't need to become a gender equality expert, but we are expected to actively use our executive position, leadership and management skills to promote gender equality in our workplace and in our peace, security and development work. Therefore, the Folk Berner Dot Academy, the Swedish government agency for peace, security and development, has designed a gender-responsive leadership framework that focuses on five key leadership skills that we can and should be taking to drive gender equality forward. Let's have a quick look at each skill. Lead by example is about being credible as a leader by taking visible action on gender equality. For example, ensuring that gender equality is high on the agenda and calling out sexist behaviors. Set priorities and targets. Know your gender equality mandates and implementation gaps to jointly set strategic priorities and measurable targets for gender equality that you and your staff can deliver on. Communicate clearly and convincingly. Use gender responsive language, such as police officer, instead of policeman, and consistently communicate the importance of gender equality. Manage your staff resources and activities. Build an equitable work environment. Strive for gender balance and ensure that your staff have what they need to do their daily work in a gender equal way. Hold yourself and others to account. Follow up on the work for gender equality by using existing routines and informal mechanisms for accountability, such as regular check-ins, feedback, media reporting, and external evaluations to make sure you are on track to achieving your targets on gender equality. Thanks so much. So that was a short intro to our framework on gender responsive leadership with five key leadership skills. And I'm thinking, let's test it out. So I'm going to ask uh, all of you in the room to start thinking about how well do the leaders within your organization, um, how well are they doing on these five key gender responsive leadership skills? Now, if you're a leader, you can take the moment, do some critical reflection, it's anonymous, um, and rate yourself. If you are currently working within an organization, maybe picture you know, either the whole leadership group or maybe just visualize either your boss or one of the senior um, leaders within the organization and think about that particular person. Uh, if you're not currently working in an organization, uh, think back to when you were and uh, a leader or the leadership team there. 
um, or leaders that you have are in contact with today. So I told you we were going to be using Menti and now this is the moment. Um, so uh, I'm assuming most of us have either cell phones or a tablet around. I'm gonna ask you to pull it out and go to www.menti.com. And once you're there, it's going to ask you for a password or a code. And you can enter 61920938, as you can see on the screen. And it's going to ask you to, to do kind of a scale rating of five questions. So when you're in Menti, the questions are this. So on uh, lead by example, to what extent have you seen um, your organization's leaders or yourself intervene in sexism? Now, what do we mean by intervene in sexism? Um, if there's a sexist comment, if there's inappropriate language, um, if there's behavior that's not acceptable, um, do you see the leader that you have in mind or yourself do they say something? Do they speak out? Um, do they intervene in some way? First question. And you can see we, we have the, um, uh, you can either go from excelling to not quite there yet. So we have a spectrum. Second question, set priorities and targets. To what extent do your organization's leaders set strategic and measurable targets on gender equality and women's rights? So here, um, oftentimes you have organizational policy, you have kind of maybe broader targets, but are those translated down um, to your level in the organization? In your work plan for your team, do you have targets on gender equality? Does, um, do the leaders make sure that you work together and set these targets? And do they communicate clearly and convincingly on gender equality? So not just on International Women's Day, is it incorporated into the leadership of your organization when they're speaking publicly and internally? Are they talking about gender equality? Do they own the language? Are they comfortable with it? Are they convincing? And um, fourth, managing personnel, resources, um, and activities. It's great to communicate well on gender equality, but Money matters. And the question here really is, are the leaders in your organization or yourself allocating sufficient funding for women, peace and security or gender equality? And then fourth, I mean, fifth, last but not least, um, accountability. And uh, this is so important. You can have the targets, you can have the communication, but are leaders in your organization holding you accountable or are you holding your staff accountable for meeting these targets on gender equality is it in the performance reviews are you being given feedback is it in an action uh, after action review template is there um you know a culture of of accountability around gender equality so i see that we have lots of answers here on menti and um, uh, quite positive. And I think this reflects that in most organizations, you do have leaders who are taking proactive action on gender equality. And you also have others who might be needing a bit of a boost. And this is interesting because this isn't the first time I've done this exercise. And quite consistently, um, the uh, leadership action that, uh, that um, maybe needs most support or where there's most room for improvement is actually number five on accountability. And we're seeing that here today. So this is in particular um, more and more important that we look at and critically examine how well are we doing on gender responsive leadership? Because we are right now seeing um, a definite, uh, we're seeing more and more organizations incorporate language around gender responsive leadership into their policy. The, the EU was definitely the first 
Um, but now, for instance, the new UN system-wide gender equality acceleration plan includes clear language on gender responsive leadership. NATO's updated women, peace and security policy does the same. So thank you so much, Nicholas, and thank you um, for uh, giving us some answers here on Menti. We see that there's lots of leaders taking action. We also see from your answers, there is room for improvement um, to build leaders' motivation, knowledge and skills on gender responsive leadership. So now let us hear um, more about this handbook on gender responsive leadership, which we keep mentioning. So I would like to welcome Leslie Groves Williams, a senior leadership and gender equality consultant and author of the Gender Responsive Leaders Handbook, and Gabriella Elroy, Handbook Editor, and Senior Specialist on Women, Peace and Security here at the Folke Bernadotte Academy. I have a few questions for you, um, including those that participants have shared during their registration forms, and we welcome more questions in the Q&A. So this is a great time. Start writing your questions for Leslie and Gabriella. So, Leslie, why write a handbook on gender responsive leadership? Well, I think the most important thing to say wasn't was that this wasn't our idea. This was demand driven. And we really wrote it to respond to a direct request from leaders. And for a number of years, I'd been getting the same question. Um, mm -hmm. I'd been hearing that, Leslie, I'm, I'm fully on board with gender equality on women's rights. I am finally in a leadership position to do something about it. I want to use this position most effectively to make sustainable change. So what exactly are the best entry points for me as a leader and a manager? And what concretely can and should I be doing? And fortunately, I came across Gabrielle and the Folke Bernadotte Academy, who and yourself, who were also being asked the same question. So we teamed up and to provide the answer to this question, we were also interested in what the answer would be. And the result is this handbook that we're discussing today. So our point of departure, as Marcus said, was we really don't need leaders to be gender experts. Yeah, mm -hmm. our leaders have got really top quality gender experts, many of who are in this room. Shout out to all of you for your hard work. But what we do need from our leaders is for them to be good leaders. And being a good leader means being fair, it means being non-discriminatory, and it means ensuring that your organisation does actually meet its policy commitments on gender equality, women, peace and security. And we really felt that there was a gap here in terms of support that is focused on the daily work of leaders, of mm -hmm. managers, working in peace, security, but also development, humanitarian organisations. So we really set out to answer questions like, how can leaders do what they do best, but in a gender responsive way? What skills practically do they need and what actions do they need to take? And then how do they know that they are doing a good enough job? So we wanted to provide practical guidance with concrete mm -hmm. examples that was really based on research and evidence. So that was the starting point. Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, fantastic. So, Gabriella, how long was this handbook in the making? Well, let me tell you like this, it was longer than we first intended. Uh, I think what Leslie painted was quite an ambitious uh, endeavor. And when we started out, it was to make a perfect practical handbook. But along the way, when we had the first draft, we also realized that we really need to test this material. So we had the opportunity to adapt the content into a comprehensive learning program and to pilot it together with UN DPPA and DPO. And that was really the starting point because then demand starting to grow already. And we took a decision that it was important to prioritize uh, practical implementation to meet this demand. Uh, and at the same time to learn and test the materials even further. Mm -hmm. So today we have implemented this program. Uh, we have implemented nine full programs for the UN, for the EU and for the OSCE. Uh, we have reached a total of 135 leaders through these programs. 
uh, 72 women and 63 men, to be precise. And they gave us, of course, invaluable feedback. Uh, we had the opportunity to, to evaluate the programs. Uh, and we also, of course, learned through our own experiences what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but we also realized that it's not enough that we sit and think. We also wanted others uh, to look at this material. So we invited four external reviewers, four gender equality uh, experts outside of FBA and outside of Leslie. Uh, so thank you specifically to Aruna Rao, Anu Pillay, Jenny Chapman, and Bonnie Muradi, Muradi for invaluable feedback. Uh, but of course, we also have more experts internally at FBA. So we also made sure that we had feedback from our leadership and gender equality experts internally. So as you hear, uh, this has been a truly sort of building the car while driving it process. And it does mean that it took longer than we expected, but it also means that we today already have come a long way. Uh, the response to gender responsive leadership has been overwhelmingly positive, maybe even more than what we expected, even as Leslie said, we were, we were responding to real demand. Uh, we see interest growing every day. And maybe more importantly than anything, uh, today when we are launching and sharing this handbook, we can confidently say that we know that these materials work. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, on to Leslie, um, what can we find in this handbook? What is in this handbook? And I just have to say that as of a few minutes ago, you can now find the handbook on the FBA um, Gender Responsive Leadership website. So it's out there. What can people find in the handbook, Leslie? Yeah, so mm. lots. <laughs> So we've got research and we did a lot of research, as you can imagine, over the years. We've got data, we've got good practices and we've structured it around those five leadership skills that we showed you in the cartoon that were also the basis of that mentee exercise you just did. So um, the first sort of bulk of content is gender responsive leadership actions. So here you've got really clear guidance on what actions you can take with links to additional resources, videos, podcasts, texts. Um, and this guidance answers super practical questions like, how do I tackle sexism in the workplace? How do I ensure that less obvious organizational processes are gender responsive? For example, our budgeting and procurement. How do I ensure that I'm informed by gender analysis, not just my program staff or my gender advisors, but how do I ensure I am informed by gender analysis? What informal accountability mechanisms are at my disposal? So, you know, we saw that that accountability piece was one of the, the lower scoring. So, you know, go and share chapter skill five with the, the leaders that you know to help them bring those skills up to date. Other questions like, well, what smart gender responsive leadership target should I set? And so on. So we really focus on the day to day functions and tasks of leaders and managers. You know, this isn't a distant piece of writing. You know, um, all of you, all your leaders, yourselves, you have different needs. Yeah, you're working in different places. You have different areas of expertise, thematic areas. But I do promise that all of you will find something in here that you can implement immediately and directly ultimately this is what it's all about isn't it implementation that that's why we're here um in addition to that we have some wonderful real life examples we scoured the globe looking for leaders um, who could share the kind of actions they've been taking on so we have some really inspiring leaders in there some i've seen already are in here hello today so hi omar you're here bruno killian and others um whose names i might not have registered so you can find out what they've been doing in the handbook and then it's a handbook rather than a book so we've really incorporated what we've called reflect and act exercises so they're there to just trigger your own thinking and use for discussion in your team you know how are we doing here how are we doing there um and then at the end of each section, we have a self-assessment um, exercise. 
in which you can identify the gender responsive leader act, leadership actions that you're taking or maybe your boss is taking mm -hmm. and those that you would like to prioritize going forward so it's super practical Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Leslie. I mean, big fan of practical tips and examples, things that I can actually, you know, learn from and implement. Um, so how can the handbook be used, Leslie? So lots of different ways. So you can choose to use it as a standalone manual. So you can take it, work your way through it. Um, you can dip into it in whichever order you want. You might already have like triggered, right, I really want to be thinking about accountability. But one thing we do recommend is leadership starts with oneself, doesn't it? Um, looking at our biases, privileges and stereotypes is the absolute starting point for good leadership practice. So we've got a lot of data and tips in there. So we'd encourage you to start with that skill one on leading by example. Um, you can take it with you, you know, read it on the plane, complete the self reflection exercises when you've got a quiet moment. You can practice the skills with your team. You know, we encourage a lot of our leaders to do this work in a participatory way with their team because good leadership isn't somebody standing alone, is it? We know that. Um, and many of our participants have been, even discussed using the materials with their friends and family. So we'd encourage you to do that, you know, have fun with it. Um, and you can choose to use it alongside a formal training program. So the handbook's now accompanied by a full training package. We've got a participant workbook. We've got a facilitator's guides. And all of these, as Gabriella said, have received extensive monitoring and um, evaluation feedback. And then that wasn't enough. So we thought, let's see if uh, gender advisors could just pick this up and use it. So UNODC uh, kindly um, served to support that function. And the, lead, the gender advisors um, who used it said it was really quite simple to pick up and use. So we were really pleased about that. And we made changes they suggested. And a really important point to just raise is, and I can say this, but FBA um, is one of the most generous donors, the most generous donor I've ever worked with. So all the materials are open source. They're all free. Take them, use them, because our aim is for leaders to have access to these powerful tools so that they can really leave behind a legacy of gender equality based on their own sphere of influence and their own personal leadership approach. So that's what I think. But Gabriella, I'm sure you've got your ideas as well. Anything, anything that you'd like to add to that? Well, I would simply add, uh, I mean, in my vision, I would wish for people to take our materials and, well, use and abuse them, but for inspiration. Uh, as Leslie has, has described, they are full of practical tips and exercises and what to do and what not to do. Uh, so take that, try it. but add it with your own experience and your own knowledge and your own specific context. context. So we are not saying that, that take it. And I mean, if you want to take it and use it as it is, please do so. Uh, but it can also be used to meet your own experiences and your own practices. And as I already described before, this has been and continues to be a learning process, we are still learning. And what we are doing here today when we are now sharing these materials for the purpose of others to take them on and continue to develop them is exactly to inviting you into this learning process. And I would be so happy and encourage you to also contact us and tell us how it's going and what's your experience, what worked, what didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any suggestions for additions? Because we will continue to, to learn. And by, by now sharing this, we are simply inviting all of you to join us in, in developing the best gender responsive leadership practices. Fantastic. Um, so what's your favorite part? of the handbook. Over to you, Leslie. What's your favorite, if you had to pick one? So for me, it's a really, really helpful bit of it, which is to help leaders narrow down on their leadership priorities and targets for gender equality um, and women's rights so that those organizational policies and strategies that we've been developing for decades become live and real in the hands of individual leaders mm -hmm. so that they can really see this as about my leadership this is about me first and foremost it's about how i lead by example it's about how i manage my biases and stereotypes 
It's about I, how I hold myself and my team to account. Um, and this is often an ongoing light bulb moment for our own participants and readers because they can really find themselves in the materials. So I think that would be my, my, my top one. Mm -hmm. And Gabriella, what is your favorite part? Well, my favorite part is actually the whole framework. Uh, it's it's the way the skills come together and how they relate to each other because there is a very clear logic. I think it looks very simple, but I think we can we can uh, sort of here tell people that we have spent a lot of discussion uh, debating and and talking about what is the right thing and the best way to do things. But if I do, if I if I should just highlight one thing from the handbook, I would uh, pick the action, how to work strategically with your gender advisor. Um, both because it somehow highlights the fact that we have already emphasized that we are not expecting leaders to do it alone, uh, but it also somehow indicates that we know from experience, we know from, from gender advisors out there and from leaders themselves, that the, the use of the gender advisor or the gender focal point is not always the most effective one. And I think that the handbook has a lot of, a lot of simple and practical examples and advice on how to change that so that leaders actually can use their gender advisors and their gender focal points or whatever they have in the most effective way as strategic support functions, which is really what they are meant to be. Mm -hmm. But Kristen, what about you? <laughs> you are co-editor of the handbook. So tell us what's your favorite bit. Uh, thanks, Leslie. Um... You know, uh, like many of us having spent 20 odd years working on gender equality, um, come across various forms of resistance and pushback, some reoccurring and, you know, some new coming in new shapes and forms. And so I really think that uh, under skill three on communication, having a specific part on how to handle pushback and resistance has been really useful for me and useful for a lot of leaders who I've been working with, who um, in certain contexts have noted, you know, increasing backlash, increasing uh, resistance to talk about gender equality, to talk about women's rights. And there, I think it's really empowering to, um, to have a few tips and tools to know that there are things that I can be doing, that we can all be doing to prevent that type of pushback from occurring in the first place, to be ready for it when it comes, and to, um, you know, to professionally have these difficult conversations on gender equality and strive for some behavioral change in that. Um, so that, that would be one of my favorites. So now from our favorites over to some questions from participants. So uh, we have some questions that came in when you registered and coming in over the Q&A right now. So let's take some of these. So Leslie, um, a few participants are asking us, you know, why have we decided to call it gender responsive leadership? Why is this a handbook on gender responsive leadership rather than feminist or transformative leadership? Great question. And it's one we actually we spent a lot of time. I remember our first meeting in in, in, in in Sunday where we talked about this, you know, what should we call it? And we went through all the different options. Um, but I think at the end of the day, our approach is based on policy. Yeah, we, we, we want to support leaders to implement policy. And there was already existing um, policy language for gender responsive leadership, both in the EU policy and in UN policy. So that was our entry point. And um, I've been using the term because I've been thinking a lot of the, over the years about gender responsive budgeting. So gender responsive leadership just felt coherent, felt like a coherent continuation of existing language. And also it felt proactive. So there was also the option around gender sensitive leadership. And it was like, no, we don't need sensitive leaders. Yeah, of course you want sensitive leaders, but ultimately you want responsive leaders. You want you want an active verb in that. We want leaders who actually do something um, and make change happen. So that's that's where we chose the responsive, based on sort of policy language, based on on the sort of the, the sense sense behind the, behind that word. But also, you know, obviously we have 
decades of really hard, hard, hard work by um, women's rights organizations, by feminist movements, to even get to this point that we can have this kind of language and that we can sit here um, you know, as three women having this conversation. So, you know, we, we are always walking on the shoulders of giants, standing on the shoulders of giants. So, you know, remembering that's where we're coming from, but also we have, um, and you'll see this when you read through it, we've really incorporated elements of um, what people call feminist leadership principles. So we have an emphasis on power sharing, on being relational, collaborative, open, self-reflective. And of course this said, we don't want to reinforce stereotypes that you know these, these are the stereotypical feminine characteristics. And obviously there's a lot of men out there um, who've taken our program who are collaborative, open and self-reflective. Um, we also talk a lot about self-care in the program. I think that's a really important piece, especially with how you know the modern work world just seems to keep speeding up and speeding up. Um, but ultimately, you know, we can call it what we like, but all of this is basically good leadership. You know, we shouldn't be discriminating, we should be fair, and we should be working on behalf of all of those in whose name we work. And we want to be confident that that's that's what we're doing. Mm. Fantastic. Um, another question that we got in from a participant was how are we incorporating intersectionality in our work uh, in the handbook on gender responsive leadership? Yeah, yeah. So um, we've got some we've got some nice little sections in there that offer definitions and other things if people want to know more. But I think if we're to, just to put it into sort of plain English about how we do this um, and it's translated into other languages. So it's not just plain Spanish, plain French, plain English. One of the most fundamental questions, you know, if we're thinking about intersectionality and gender equality is to just say, if someone refers to men, well, which which men are they talking about? If someone refers to women, well, which women are they talking about? Because no group is homogenous and gender equality is fundamentally about equality for all. And Beijing Platform Faction is really super clear about this. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just for those women with the greatest voice. Uh, those who um, you know live in urban areas or who have linguistic, ethnic, or other geographical privilege, um, such as myself. But you know it wasn't as easy as it sounds to integrate an intersectional lens. So many of the studies that I found, despite digging, we were really intentional with the digging. It was in English-speaking journals. It was from studies that took place in North America and European and mostly private sector organisations. Because mm -hmm. in our field, a lot of these um, studies and you know I've, I've run them. They're confidential. We don't have access to the data. Um, and those those kind of studies did often refer to women as a generic category. So um, I think we've got a long way to go. And those of you in our audience who are involved in commissioning research or who are monitoring evaluation experts, you know, really trying to um, require of ourselves and of our colleagues to really put in that intersectional lens um, and make sure we have this kind of intersectional data in our baselines and in our monitoring and evaluation data in our research and analysis. So this said, <laughs> that was a big caveat, but we did really try where we could. Um, so for example, we've got some data in there on how racial minority women, lesbian and trans women and disabled women face high rates of sexual harassment. Um, and having this kind of breakdown can be really helpful. And if we don't have this kind of breakdown, I really would ask, well, how targeted are our interventions? How appropriate? our interventions are we really going to have uh, the impact that we want um you know we talk about leaving no one behind well we really can't do that if we don't have intersectional data um and then the other thing we tried to do was in our good practice examples which i've me mentioned we purposefully also tried to make sure we had examples of male and female leaders from different nationalities representing different regions different organization different areas of expertise and then just a final point, Kristen, if I may, um, we also, the tips that are in there around tackling bias, um, being an ally, uh, addressing sexism, you, they can all be used for intersex intersecting forms of discrimination. So, you know, if you've got sexism that's compounded um, with racism, um, you can still use those tips. You know, if you have um, homophobia that's compounding sexism and racism, et cetera, et cetera, you can use these tips to mitigate those forms of bias as well. Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, 
Gabriella, we've also gotten uh, quite a few practical questions from participants, um, you know, eager to take action, uh, which is fantastic, saying, you know, how can I join a gender responsive leadership learning program? Where can I find these materials? Is there a certificate? What are the next steps? Well, I think that the first uh, place to go is really the website that you refer to. It's the gender responsive, the FBA's gender responsive leadership uh, website, which we see here and now. And as you mentioned, Christine, uh, not long ago, by now, you can also find the handbook there. And there we, we put, uh, we have different kinds of information. We have different kinds of materials. We have uh, the full film of, of the clip that you showed before. We have other inspirational films um, and, and whatever uh, new information that we, will, that we will develop, we will definitely put up there. Uh, and it was also mentioned uh, that we do uh, translate all the materials that we have into French and Spanish as well, since these are two uh, languages that we also work with a lot and, and where we, so we started there. Uh, the handbook is not up and running in those languages yet, but it will be. And also the facilitator's guide and the workbook will be in this in this website. So I would say that's the go-to place uh, for anything if you want to know if there is anything new and so forth. Uh, with regards to joining a gender responsive leadership learning program, unfortunately, at this point of time, we don't have an open program, which means we don't have a program which anyone can apply to. And the reason is that when we work on gender responsive leadership, the, the ultimate goal is institutional and, institutional and organizational capacity. And there we simply know that the most effective way of working is to work with a, with a tailored partnership uh, where we work with several leaders from one organization. So at the moment, we don't have an open program. That may change in the future, but at the moment there is no such program. So. If you want to join, I have two tips, nevertheless. I would say, first of all, find out if there is a gender responsive leadership uh, initiative in your organization uh, or ongoing or planned. We have currently work ongoing with the UN and we have planned uh, work planned for the EU uh, and the UN for fall as well. So there could be that there is an initiative that you are the right person to join. Uh, but I would also uh, ask around because we do have plans and discussions with partners through our colleagues who work in, for an example, Colombia, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and also with regional uh, partners in Eastern and Western Africa, such as ECOWAS and IGAD. Uh, so if you're lucky, there is something uh, cooking at the moment that you potentially could join. And if there isn't, then I would say uh, take the initiative, try to get something going uh, in your organization or together with an organization or mission or what it could be. Uh, use the materials. That's what they are for. We want others to take them and to use them. And even though we cannot promise, we unfortunately, we cannot support everyone with direct implementation, but we are more than happy to answer questions and we are very glad when people uh, contact us. So please, uh, please do so, even if we cannot give the full support at this point of time. Um, you had a question there about certificates. So the, the full programs, uh, they come with certificates. Shorter versions sometimes come with certificates. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Gabriella. Um, and thanks so much for all your insightful questions. Uh, we had time to answer a few of them. There was a few that uh, we unfortunately didn't have time to answer, um, but reach out to us, as Gabriella said, please do. And let's continue the conversation. So um, now over to you, Leslie, as I know many of our participants are keen really to hear from our senior leaders from the UN, from the OSCE and from the EU. Thanks, thanks, Kristen. Um, so <laughs> we've been working 
as you've heard with leaders um, from across the world who are actively using their leadership position. Um, and I, I can see in the questions sometimes, you know, in the Q&A that's going, that we, you know, haven't had time to answer everything. You know, sometimes it can be a bit demoralizing to be the, le the leader in an organization or one of a small cohort who's really, you know, raising their voice. And sometimes it can feel that the other powers are stronger, but we just have to keep going and we have to take heart from those who are doing a good job. And, you know, over a thousand and twenty five people registered for today. So, you know, that solidarity that keeps us going is, is so important. So, you know, what we've been able to do is rolling out these 24 hour programs over 12 weeks using online skills workshops, workplace application, coaching. And um, I'm really happy to have three, you know, remarkable champions, former participants with us today, and, and they represent a range of the organizations we've worked with. So uh, Lloyda, uh, we have, so Lloyda Aria, who's the chief of the organized crime and illicit trafficking branch of the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, UNODC, welcome. Great to have you with us. And uh, we also have Thank Killian. You. Thanks, Lloyda. Ambassador Killian Wall, who's head of the OSC mission to Skopje. Welcome, Killian. Good afternoon afternoon and we've got Paco Garcia who's head of sector South America EU Directorate General for International Partnerships otherwise known as INPA. Welcome hello Paco. Leslie Hi, hello Paco. how are you good afternoon to all yeah isn't it great to all be here together you know we've all worked great. intensely together now now here we are with everyone so each of you has been truly leading by example when it comes to gender responsive leadership and what I've particularly loved is how each of you has tailored your leadership actions to your own unique leadership style and your own unique sphere of influence and sphere of impact. And this in turn has made each of you super impactful and inspiring. So um, two things we want to hear from you today. Firstly, I think people in our audience might want to hear a bit more about your experience as the program. And secondly, we really want to hear, well, what have you managed to achieve as gender responsive leaders? So we're going to start with a rapid response round. And um, I'm going to start with asking each of you in turn. Um, and I'll start with uh, Lloyda. So the first question, and you've got one sentence to answer each of the first three questions. So we know how busy leaders are. Yeah, I mean, we're all busy, but leaders are busy, too. So you made the space to invest in your own gender responsive leadership. So in one sentence, what motivated what motivated you to sign up and complete this 24 hour GRL learning program? Lloyda. Yeah, I felt that I was ill equipped um, to really um, translate as a leader the UNODC strategy on gender equality and empowerment of women into action. I needed the tools to understand how I could do that. And I feel that participating in the gender responsive leadership gave me the tools that I need. And it is still a learning progress uh, for me. Thanks, Lloyda. Same question to you, Killian. Yeah, well, I felt that in the position that I had at the time, I was the deputy head of mission of the largest, I think, civilian presence uh, in Kosovo at the time. I felt that I was fairly gender sensitive, uh, but I lacked the skills to implement it. Uh, uh, so I really felt I wanted to walk the walk and I wanted to bring about change in my own organization, in the work culture. And I felt it was also important for me as a man to engage and to become an ally. Right, thanks. Thanks, Killian. Paco, same question to you. Okay, so in in my case, this is this is a bit of twofold reason. Uh, my previous job before the South America leadership I have now was leading the sector, the, the sector of gender equality in the commission and concretely putting together the EU gender action plan number three. And as part of this gender action plan, I recommended that leaders should follow a responsive leadership training or whatever. Not this one in particular, I recommended that training. 
So when I moved to South America, A, I wanted to, to lead by example and, and apply to myself what I had proposed to apply to others. But second, I, I moved to a department where, where I felt there was action to be taken and I wanted to be able to exchange with other leaders, uh, get access to the best practice, practice uh, and, and to the best experts and apply to my current job. So that's, that's what moved me to, to, to take to it, to invest. Training for myself, yeah. Great, thank you. Right, question two, one sentence each only. What was your favorite or most useful moment on the program, Killian? I think that it was uh, so applicable. Mm -hmm. I could take away after each session something that I could implement and apply the next day. Very hands on. Great, and we'll hear a bit more about that afterwards. Paco, one sentence, your favorite, most useful moment. My favorite was this change with others on the same topics that applied to me. My most useful was uh, the coaching one to one. Great, thank you, Lloyd. Um, my um, most favorite was um, working with the trainers and the UNODC gender team to put together my gender equality action plan. Great, thank you. Right, final of our quick can't answer questions. What would you say to other leaders considering taking this program? Paco, one sentence. That if you really uh, think seriously of, of taking as a leader action on, on, on gender equality issues, you cannot do this alone. You have to do it A, with your team. But B, this is a luxury, having access to your expertise in, in Jorge Bernardo Academy and to the exchanges with other leaders that have very common projects. Don't do it without this kind of training. Great. Thanks, Paco. Uh, Killian? I take the liberty really to have two sentences, OK? I think <laughs> okay. first, do it. Uh, uh, it pays off. Uh, and don't let yourself be discouraged or influenced or drawn into ideological discussions. It's not an ideological issue. We shouldn't allow this to be put in that corner. Uh, um, it pays off in many aspects. I think we all work in countries in transition. Uh, we bring about change. Uh, we're working in societies in transition. Um, it is actually absurd, absurd to believe that we can ignore more than half of the population. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Killian. And Lloyda, what about you? I, I would say seize the moment. Immerse yourself in this unique opportunity really to uh, embark on a journey that will give you tools um, to make you a gender responsive leader. Right. Thank you. So, you know, all of you have had quite diverse, different experiences, which is what, what is so lovely. And it goes back to that sort of tailoring to your own leadership needs. So um, as part of the, the Gender Responsive Leadership Programme, and Lloyd mentioned, each of you developed a Gender Responsive Leadership Action Plan, and you had six months to a year to implement it. Um, because at the end of the day, we're all about impact. So um, I think we'd love to eat, hear from each of you. Um, what is the story of change? Uh, towards gender equality and women's rights that you are most proud of having led following on for the GRL program. So the story of change that you're most proud of having led. And I think, Paco, your turn to go first. Okay. So my action plan had uh, had two parts. One was external to on, on the results of our programs in South America and one was internal to my team. Uh, on the external one, uh, I realized that uh, the EU Gender Action Plan has, has an objective that 85% of our new programs by 2025 have to have gender equality at least as a significant, significant objective. And I realized that South America was lagging behind all other regions in the world and we were at 70 when most of them were already 85. So we put an action plan for that with my team, with other people in the unit, with our delegations. And I'm very, very proud to say that we move in one year from 70 to 94. So we are now exceeding the, the objective and from lagging behind almost everybody to being one of the top services in the commission. So that's that's very, that's very I'm very proud of that. Then on the internal part, uh, at the beginning discussing with you, Leslie, you will remember, 
moving to South America, I have a team of six men, and many of them older than 55, like myself. So I thought that there was nothing to be done on gender equality there, a, a team of, of only men. But however, we, we, we work together and, and, and we ask the women that have to work with us whether there were any issues by the fact that you have to work with a team of six men and which of course we all thought no oh, nothing we are all super modern people super gender equality mind minded and i discovered much to my surprise that there were many many issues that that uh, women in in our service in our unit had by the fact of working with us a group of men behaving like men and not thinking on gender equality terms because we are all men so i we put this plan on that and that is changing the dynamic that's still work in progress but uh, but it also it also show many things in the unit that a group of six men were willing to take action on gender equality despite being a, an only men team that's great, isn't it? And it, it, it's it's about sort of questioning ourselves, isn't it? From that initial assumption, well, what can we do on gender equality for all men to actually finding some really powerful tools to what sounded quite unsurmountable, actually, to move your gender marker that dramatically. So it just, it just shows, isn't it, when we make that leadership commitment and we do it in a participatory way, we get change. You know, it's yeah. not rocket science. You know, yeah. we're at a time in our history, we've got the policy strategies, now it's time to just do it. Okay, that's great, Paco. Thank you for those examples. Um, Lloyda, what about you? What's the story of change that you're most proud of having led following on from the Gender Responsive Leadership Program? Yeah, it's part of my uh, action plan um, in, in order to hold myself accountable and also to hold my team members accountable. I realized that it would be beneficial if um, a tailor-made training could be also made for my middle managers. And um, um, with the collaboration of our gender team, I put money aside and they helped me hire a consultant. Actually, Leslie and another consultant helped us run this training course. And um, the, surprisingly, um, now, uh, the middle managers who have attended the training are uh, replicating that training also, holding themselves and their sub-team members accountable. So now we have many people who are using the same tools, uh, speaking the same language, um, also trying to influence the change um, uh, in the intergovernmental processes that we service and this has really been a welcome and surprising change, which I did not anticipate when I signed up for the course. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it, Lloyd? And again, you know, but this was your courageous leadership because you made a decision you were going to ring fence that funding. And you said, right, my middle managers need to go through this. And they did. And now they're making a creative step of saying, I'm going to ring fence that, that funding. And I know what I've heard from, from your middle managers is they're really appreciating that now as a branch, you've got a common language, you've got common commitments. Um, and they're seeing this also being followed through by regional directors. Um, because for our audience, you and ODC have already run this now three times, uh, potentially going to do a fourth time, which means there's like a whole cadre now of, of senior leadership that have gone through this. So, as an organization, there's this, this shared language. And now Lloyd has that within her branch with her middle managers. And, and it's really powerful. C congratulations, um, Lloyd, as well. So Killian, let's let's hear from you. Your the story. I know there are many stories of change that that, that you could share, but let, let's hear, let's hear one of them, the one that you're most proud of having led. Yeah, thank you very much. Um I wanted to focus really on the administration side of the house because, you know, I had rolled out extensive trainings for the programmatic part and introduced the gender marker. So we were fine in, the, in, in terms of the programmatic work of the mission. But I looked at the uh, administration side of the house and looked at fleet management, looked at budgeting, uh, procurement, human resources processes. Uh, um, and introduction of more gender responsive human resources was relatively easy. This was an easy fix, basically, because there's a lot of you know best practice out there that we could incorporate uh, swiftly. Um, but the biggest 
item, biggest ticket items for me was actually how do we ourselves as an organization get a gender responsive budget? Yeah. Uh, um, and that was quite an uphill struggle, actually. Uh, um, because on one hand, you know, they argued, well, we kind of sort of have indirectly gender responsive budget because the programmatic activities are fully gender mainstreamed. Uh, and you have introduced the policy of not uh, approving gender marker zero, gender marker one project any longer, they have to be higher. Um, but again, you know, we had a blind spot on the administrative part uh, um, of the mission. And, and I have to say, I failed miserably. <laughs> in the full introduction of the gender responsive uh, budget, uh, mainly because, you know, there were, it was too big for me as a mission to do it. Uh, you know, that's something that ha has to be rolled out uh, uh, at the uh, central level. Uh, um, and at least, you know, I started the debate, but I looked then into gender responsive procurement. Um, and that is something, that's a project uh, program that we rolled out. Uh, uh, so we realized that women-owned businesses aren't coming to the OSCE. So we reached out uh, uh, to uh, um, the Association of uh, Women Entrepreneurs, uh, and we did a mapping um, of women-owned businesses in Kosovo. Uh, we had a targeted outreach uh, to those uh, women and to their businesses. Uh, um, and then, you know, we managed to change the terms of references and also the selection criteria. Um, and that was, uh, I felt, a good step that we did. Uh, uh, and I'm currently in the process of introducing this also here in the Mission to Scotland. Yeah, and I think, Killian, I mean, it's great. It, it, what's really fascinating here is also as leaders, you move roles, don't you? Um, and, and so, you know, and I know I'm working on an EU program at the moment and um, some some of the participants have mo are moving to each other's um, uh, countries of operations so they can also do handover notes, <laughs> say, well, this was my gender responsive leadership action plan. Um, can you take it over? And so you now moving into a different country can also I think you want to arrange like a study visit to go and, and meet the finance colleagues. Um, in Kosovo, which I think is is really fabulous, isn't it? Because it's that ongoing learning, which is what we're all doing. Um, and just to share, when I was speaking to your finance um, director, Priscilla Manis, it was quite one of the things she found surprising when she asked the women businesses, well, why aren't you applying? Why aren't you, you responding to these tenders? And what they said to her was exactly what we hear from HR. Um, you know, that if, if a woman meets, you know, 100% of the criteria for a job, she'll apply. If a man meets 60, 70%, he'll apply. And they, the women businesses said exactly the same. They were saying, well, who am I to apply to the OSCE? So that internalized sexism was quite an interesting revelation. Um, and Priscilla was also saying now some of the other government departments have seen what she's been doing and they're really interested in this. So it has such a knock on effect, doesn't it? All, all of your actions, all three of you, what you've done has had a knock on effect, um, which I really, I really love. Um, OK, so three lovely stories of change. So um, thinking about fellow leaders who may be with us today and they want to wrap up, ramp up their own gender responsive leadership. What would be your top recommendation to them? A, sen a sentence each. Um, let's start with you, Lloyda. Um, I would say um, think creatively about the change you would want to bring about, uh, be it through your uh, gender equality action plan in your workplace to see how sustainable it will be so that um, not only you will be the driver of this change, but everyone in your team can be the driver of change uh, so that when you leave, um, there is sustainability of the good work that you have started. And when the people that you are working with also leave, you would have established this culture of um, gender equality, of, of advocating and, and um, implementing gender equality and the empowerment of women. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Lloyd. Uh, and, and it's that word culture that's so important, isn't it? As they say, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Lloyd. That's great. Uh, Killian, to you. Yes, I would say ask questions and challenge the responses you get. Because, you know, it's again, it's a change process. Um, and there's a, I think, natural pushback <laughs> 
from an organization and maybe for from human beings in general you know we don't like change so much uh, um, and uh, i've heard a lot of no we cannot do this no we have never done this uh, um, and uh, in the end it turned out not to be through not to be true so you know i think we need to be creative we need to be stubborn and we need to have stamina i love that creative stubborn and stamina yeah, yeah. absolutely and and you three are the living evidence that you know when you step up things happen yeah fabulous thank you Paco what about you top recommendation to follow lead, fellow leaders and mid uh, okay uh, in my case I would say no matter how skillful or advanced you are on, on on gender matters don't do it alone even if you're a person who knows a lot about gender equality today just by exchanging 10 minutes by with Killian and with Lloyd I, I got a couple of things that say, oh, yes, why not? Uh, gender responsive procurement, for instance. Uh, so you have to involve your people, you have to drag them with you. But also, this course is really, is really down to earth, it's practical. It's, it brings a lot of people with similar problems together, and you have access to a lux of expertise and, and, and ideas. and. Uh, which can be tailor-made to you. So I, I, I found it, a, a, I mean, I was coming from the gender equality unit, but, but the course really challenged me and, and dragged me much farther than I uh, anticipated that I would be doing. And, and, and it's part of the success is because of that, because I got other people and, and the course that, that pushed me beyond what I had expected. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks, Paco. And, and 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 that's it. One of the methods that we actually use is this peer review, peer support, um, so that you can all support each other and, like you say, push each other, inspire, motivate. That's fabulous. Okay. Um, if it's okay with you, and I wasn't sure if we'd have time for that, we do actually have some questions for you. Is it okay if I ask you some? Um, so um we have a question uh actually for Paco. Um so it says, dear Paco, um, do you think um, from your interesting experience with the women in your team would likely be experienced within Central Europe? In my authority, there is a high density of men, all of them who think they are quite modern, just as I do. So I, I think the question is, do you think your experience, which is probably difficult to ask because you work in the Americas, uh, would likely be experienced within Central Europe, where there's a high density of men all, also thinking themselves to be quite modern? Yeah, so I, think I, yeah. I, I think my feeling, I mean, I, I work in Kyrgyzstan and, 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 and Central Asia and Afghanistan in the past as crisis response planner. I think this would apply to any setting. It's not because uh, I work for South America. Is we? I mean, there's a lot of men out there that think, of course, no, I, 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 I am a super gender equality guy, and then, but then, then you don't prove it with that. And then, and then when you ask around to to the women, you think, of course, they they are going to be say that we are perfect, and then you realize that you are not perfect, and that what they are saying is actually right and you haven't realized of condescending comments uh, or saying yeah we, we don't have more women because in as head of cooperation because some of our posting is, is uh, tough places like what uh, is a man more prepared to go to a tough place than a woman and and there are things that that people don't don't even think and 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 i'm sure this is applicable to south america to africa and to sweden uh, that uh, that when you ask uh, when you are only men or only women and you ask the other part uh, there will be matters that you have not thought of that you have not imagined and then if you ask then you can correct and at least by the mere act of asking you're establishing a dynamic that wasn't there before that's a great answer, Paco. And 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 we have a um we have a section on allyship, don't we, in the program? And step one of a good ally is to actually listen, <laughs> ask and listen. 
don't ever assume ask and listen so yeah i mean it's it's a lovely example that you've got there and i'm glad there was a follow-up question um and i've got a question from joanna skinner that i'm going to ask to both lloyd and killian if that's okay so um it's a sort of tactical question i think um, so do you have any advice for gender advisors who are trying to convince their organizational leadership to want to become gender responsive leaders? So how can we get their interest, especially when they think they're already gender responsive, but really aren't? We've got a bit of a theme going on here, aren't we? People who think they're doing walking the talk, but aren't. So, yeah, how how tactics for trying to convince these these leaders to come on board on this journey? I think she's looking for some quite practical tips if you've got any. Um, so, uh, Killian, why don't you go first and then Lloyda? Yeah, it's a very good question, actually. Uh, and it's also a question that I ask myself because there's always somebody above you, right? Even if you're the head of mission, there's somebody else mm -hmm. above you. And I report to participating states. They have diverse views, let me put it this way, on gender equality. Um, I guess... Uh, Ask yourself, what's in it for them? Uh, and then present it to them in that way. Uh, try to get their vanity, if I may be that frank. Uh, and, uh, you know, and convince them that, you know, there's perhaps some low-hanging fruit for them uh, and where they can shine. Uh, and, you know, that can bring them, I think, or can perhaps bring many on board uh, um, if, you know, what's in it for them. And I think before you approach them, perhaps think about what are the constraints of these managers? Uh, because there's sometimes an impression out there that once you're a head of department or a head of mission, you can do whatever you want, but that's not the case. Uh, so you need to, I think, be quite tactical uh, uh, and smart in understanding what are the constraints. So, and what are the opportunities actually that are real? Uh, uh, because then when you get the pushback that, no, I can do this for this and that reason, uh, you can actually argue that, well, you can, and here is the way how, and this is, you know, how you will be successful. Yeah, I like that, Killian. And I think I'm just going to throw in a, a third C to, uh, you know, culture. We talked about challenge and is confidence. So often what, what I've seen is there can be a bit of a fear around gender responsive leadership of saying the wrong thing. You know, it's better to say nothing than say the wrong thing. So I like your idea of the low hanging fruit because that helps up build that confidence. I can do this. It's OK. You know, I can start with something simple and I'll be successful and then I can do the next thing. I don't have to do everything all at once, which can be quite intimidating and and, and, and scary. So, yeah, I, I, I do like that. Go for the go for the long hanging, low hanging fruit, the what's in it for me. Um, yeah, I'm building up that confidence. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, Lloyd, any tips for you um, for sort of helping uh, gender advisors to um, encourage and nudge? Uh, gender response leaders to become gender responsive leaders. Um, I think um, it helps also if they have statistics to show what it is that the organization is lacking, and to see how best to address it um, by, for instance, um, embracing. Um, a change culture of training and having more people um, um, trained on how to walk the talk and to become accountable for themselves and the, for the teams that they lead. Mm -hmm. And again, it is also a question of coming back to what is it in for them and then to see what change mm -hmm. that will uh, bring them up to the standard because in the UN, for instance, where we work, we have to always report. And starting with our reporting on where we are falling behind, where we are lagging behind, um, if uh, our people are trained, um, then we will be able to um, to show better results than what we have been doing. And, and, and also I would say rec recruit allies also recruit allies who will help you also make the case. It shouldn't be just for you because it's 
gender responsive leadership is for all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like I like that gender responsive leadership is for all of us, and and I think you really walked the talk of this practice actually, Lloyda, because in a way by training all your middle managers you didn't have to deal with individual resistance you know so it, it was actually a really strategic approach now I'm thinking thinking back on it by by training everybody together you created a momentum as well which also meant that people with individual resistance could actually work on that in a safe space um and and then come along on the journey over an extended period of time with their capacity being built to do this so there's the fourth c capacity Culture challenge, confidence, capacity, and stubbornness, <laughs> and listening. So we've got lots of verbs that we're going to leave our audience with. So I just need to thank the three of you. You're, you've been awesome all along your leadership journey that I've been on. And um, I'm really excited to hear what you're going to do next. Um, and to our audience, these are just little snippets of how different leaders do different things. One size doesn't fit all. So thank you very much, Lloyda. Thank you, Killian. Thank you, Paco. I wish you um, a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you for being generous and joining us. Thank you for having us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And I'm going to hand over to Marcus and Kristin. Thank you, Leslie. It was lovely to see you. Thanks, Paco. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye. So um, a big thank you as well from the studio here in Stockholm um, to Lloyde, to Killian, to Paco, uh, and to Leslie as well for, you know, sharing some of your takeaways from your experience in the Folke Bernadotte Academy Gender Responsive Leadership Learning Program, sharing really practical and useful tips, as well as your stories of, you know, successful change on gender equality. So, Marcus, what yes. are you taking away from today, our global launch on gender responsive leadership? Uh, well, Kristen, first of all, I, you know, we've had uh, somewhere between 300 or I think maximum 400 participants mm -hmm. uh, joining us today. That's a fantastic interest. And I think it really is a testament to the the um, high level of interest and high degree of interest mm -hmm. in in the gender responsive leadership concept in itself but um, um maybe i would say that um, personally and perhaps listening to gabriella and leslie talking about the background of this whole effort mm -hmm. I, th I think i learned something new so it it's it's highly demand driven it was an exploratory work it's gone through several years of high quality testing and consultation into becoming the actual concrete useful product that it is today, the handbook, together with all the other resources around it. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it is something that, uh, um, that we can be proud of, um, mm -hmm. I think, and um, just going from there to listening to mm -hmm. Killian Lloyder, and um and paco that their testament is really also on the usefulness of the product mm. so i sometimes um, you've all heard this i think you've been to conferences before we talk about policy and everybody says yes we need to go from policy to implementation we need to go from policy to action with with something like the gender responsive leadership handbook at hand there are no more excuses i think <laughs> and listening mm. to paco lloyd and killian uh, they have actually um, shown to us, everybody in the room, mm -hmm. that there's a huge pay it forward quality to the mm -hmm. gender responsive leadership concept. If you do it, it will provide positive impacts around you and it will continue to spread. So very good, I think. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So thanks so much, Marcus. And Thank you. Thanks so much to each and every one of you who took valuable time to join us from around the world here today for our global launch on gender responsive leadership. Download the handbook, um, adapt, use these training materials, and please do reach out to us, you know, if we can be of any assistance. So we look yes. forward to hearing from you. Open up the handbook today and choose an action. Maybe not tonight, but tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So enjoy. Thank you for today.